Thanks very much, Pravitra. Uh, and thank you also to yourself and uh, Special Interest Group for inviting me to speak this evening uh, on this particular topic. I'm just going to share my uh, slides now. Can everybody see those? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, yes. So, just a few words about myself. Uh, my own background is I'm a medical doctor uh, and I have uh, specialized in public health medicine. Uh, and I'm practicing now at the Changi General Hospital, uh, which is a regional hospital in the east of Singapore. And I have a few slides about that uh, very shortly. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking today about how we use health technology assessments. Uh, in our hospital to support uh, evidence-based decision making around the use of these technologies uh, and uh, yeah so that that would be the actual topic and not the other one that was on the previous slide that you saw which was something about the uh, financing systems in the US states so that's not correct <laughs> uh, so what I'll be just saying today is I understand this is a, a, a fairly international audience so just a few words about the context uh, where we are set, which is uh, talking a bit about Singapore. I'll say a bit about our Singapore healthcare system and uh, financing system, uh, and then focus on uh, my own institution, which is the Changi General Hospital and the health services Depa research department in which I work. Uh, and then I'll say how we use uh, the HTA uh, to help in our uh, decision-making in the hospital and giving you a case study also of one of the rapid reviews that we use uh, to make decisions uh, and some observations uh, following all that. So by way of introduction, um, I'm uh, practicing in the Republic of Singapore. That's a tiny little uh, island state, city state, if you will. Uh, it's a small country with few natural resources. We've got a young population in fairly good health, uh, although it is rapidly aging. Uh, so it's a, a very much a developed country sort of profile of diseases uh, where you've got uh, more non-communicable diseases uh, uh, generally. Uh, and here's a little map just to orientate you. Uh, There's a map of Asia or South, South Asia. Uh, and we are in Southeast Asia. Uh, if you follow the right at the top, you've got China and then you've got Indochina going down the Thai Peninsula and then the Malayan Peninsula. And right at the tip of the Malay Peninsula, you'd find uh, Singapore there. And, th and the scale of the map is such that you can't even see the shape of the island right there. And the text overshadows even the size of the island on this map. But I've got a bigger map uh, later on so you can see what they're shaped like. Uh, just to give you some uh, statistics, uh, we've got a total population of around uh, 5.7 million population. Uh, GDP per capita comparatively high. Uh, that's about uh, 82,500 per capita. Uh, and the exchange rate is about one Singapore dollars, about 75 US cents. Uh, and we've got some good uh, health statistics. Our life expectancy, fairly good, 81.5 years for males, 86.1 years. Uh, for females, and we've got some of the lowest uh, infant mortality rates and maternal mortality rates in the, in the world. When it comes to healthcare financing, it's a, a, a bit complex. Uh, we describe it as a hybrid system, uh, and uh, government subsidies really uh, end up being the largest proportion of, of the financing for the individual. Uh, so we do have universal subsidies and universal access for all Singaporeans. However, the policy is that there needs to be co-payment by patients to mitigate overconsumption. Uh, but the, there are heavy government subsidies across uh, very many different settings, and there are just too many different schemes to talk about here. Um, what we usually concentrate on when we talk about the healthcare financing is that Singapore has what we call the 3M system. Uh, so over the years, we inherited, of course, we are a former British colony and initially inherited the British uh, healthcare system. Uh, but then subsequently over the years, after independence, we developed uh, our own uh, unique healthcare system and, and financing system. Uh, and the 3Ms uh, started with the core uh, of uh, the MediSafe uh, uh, system, which is basically an uh, individual uh, health savings account. Uh, so anyone who is a salaried employee within Singapore must pay a proportion of that salary each month into their own MediSafe account. So this is considered still their own funds, but it's string fence so that they can only use it for uh, healthcare purposes and it's built up during the years of employment so that it helps with healthcare expenses especially after retirement uh, and that's just uh, the core of the system but uh, around that then you've got the insurance component which is the MediShield so that's where you have the risk pooling uh, it's a state-run low-cost health insurance scheme uh, for catastrophic expenses 
Uh, and then you can also have additional coverage available through private providers, but this is uh, quite heavily regulated as well. Uh, and then the final safety net is what we call MediFund, which is a, a medical uh, uh, endowment fund from the government uh, for groups in need and there are different kinds of MediFund. Uh, and the basic principle here is that no Singaporeans should be denied uh, necessary health care due to an inability to pay. And over the years, uh, uh, the system has become much more complex. And that's one of the maybe the issues, which is that it's, it's quite a headache to na navigate if you're new to the system. Uh, and there have been additions to the, for example, the insurance component like Elder Shield, which covers uh, uh, long-term care, long care for uh, severely disabled people. Uh, and then just last year, they introduced another component, Care Shield Life, again for long-term care for uh, uh, severely disabled, but uh, for, from a lower age group. So in the country itself, um, we've got um, a health technology assessment agency at the national level. So for some years, uh, uh, the Ministry of Health had already been using health technology assessment to uh, inform some of its funding decisions. Uh, but in 2015, uh, they, they formally created ACE, the Agency for Care Effectiveness. So that's the le national level uh, HTA agency uh, within Singapore, uh, kind of like similar to NICE. Um, uh, and uh, HTA and, and ACE issues uh, health technology assessment reports and clinical guidance to help inform funding decisions specifically within MOH and the and the health public health care system and, and thereby drive appropriate use. But of course, today's talk is not really on that, just to give you that context that within our country, we do have these uh, national uh, level uh, decisions around healthcare funding. So our, our, our function here in uh, CGH is really more to help with the hospitals uh, operational needs. Uh, and this is a map of Singapore itself. Um, and you can see that uh, as far as the healthcare system, public health care system goes, we've divided it into three regional health systems. There's a, uh, one in the West, one in the, in the central part of Singapore. And our, our Changi General Hospital uh, resides in the East. Uh, east, well, it, it's kind of like East and South and uh, it contains three uh, regional size, uh, regional uh, general hospital sized uh, uh, hospitals. Uh, Singkang General, uh, Singapore General Hospital, and then of course the Changi General Hospital, which is the most either, uh, easternmost uh, hospital in Singapore. So Changi General Hospital, or CGH, as we abbreviated, uh, was first opened in 1996. It was the first purpose-built general hospital, uh, has over a thousand uh, uh, licensed beds. Uh, it has been JCI accredited since 2005. Uh, and it's the first acute care hospital to integrate care with a community hospital. So it was actually built next to the St. Andrews Community Hospital. Uh, and uh, it serves a population of about 1.4 to 1.5 million in the, the east and northeast of Singapore. Uh, it's a tertiary level acute hospital and they have uh, a full range of uh, specialty services, uh, but they do promote especially these uh, particular ones, the integrated sleep service, You've got a breast uh, center, uh, hepatic biliary service, vascular surgery, gastroenterology, uh, endocrinology. It is also very well known for its uh, 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 sports uh, medicine uh, uh, facilities. So within the hospital, our health services research uh, group uh, has got basically these three uh, main functions. Uh, health technology is just one of them, uh, but it also does program evaluation and man management analytics and operations research. And fundamentally, um, uh, basically, it's, it's all of these are, are evaluative functions to help uh, determine uh, evidence-based resource allocation at the hospital level, and also helps to support building research uh, capacity. So if you, if you look at the, the, these three arms that we have, uh, I think analytics and operations research, everybody will, 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 will recognize quickly straight away that that's a core of the health services research. Uh, but it's interesting to look at health technology assessment and program evaluation in the sense that they are on the same spectrum where, you know, uh, before the technology comes in the hospital and gets implemented as a service, uh, this is where the health technology assessment part comes in and then you help decide whether to allow it in or not. Uh, then once it's in the hospital, then it's where the program evaluation is. After that, then you evaluate and then that will depend on the, how the program is, uh, or the technology is uh, uh, performed within the hospital setting itself. And for, talking about the HTA functions, um, mainly it's used to guide adoption of technologies, uh, uh, particularly in relation to our annual uh, budgeting process or, or the uh, strategic planning cycle within the hospital. Uh, 
Uh, we do do evidence reviews to guide the design of programs or interventions. And we also support a, a committee known as the Medical Device Oversight Committee, uh, which is uh, somewhat uh, similar uh, to uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and therapeutics committees, except that its function is really relating to medical device and procedures. So the objective uh, or, um, or ethos, if you will, of uh, health technology assessment in our hospital is that HK needs to support evidence-based decision-making at all levels so that demonstrably effective and affordable healthcare is delivered. Uh, the motto that I have is a bit like uh, saying, not because I say that it works, but I show that it works. The main areas where HTA informs decision is, uh, as I said, in the annual budgeting cycle. So all hospitals, over that matter, for that matter, all uh, business organizations would have some sort of financing and budgeting cycle. Um, what is slightly different uh, uh, with us is that we have uh, this exercise called the marketplace, uh, where proposals of new technologies or services can make a presentation before hospital management, uh, but also other departments are involved, right? Uh, anyone can actually attend these uh, sessions where they present. And they can comment on and, and give comments uh, and input on the, these proposals. Uh, so it's not just management that attends these sessions. Uh, and management may also request us based on the, uh, what has been presented to do a rapid review uh, to inform their decision making on the proposals. As I mentioned, we have a medical device oversight committee uh, and they look at introduction of new technologies or devices that come throughout the year. So not just at the marketplace exercise. Uh, and then they may request HTA to help inform their deliberations as well. And just a, a diagram here to kind of like summarize our planning uh, process, strategic planning process. Uh, every year, it more or less begins with senior management having their uh, strategic planning retreat. They issue their guidance of uh, what their strategic goals are for each year, and then launch their action plans exercise. And then part of that is to then request uh, people to submit their plans and proposals based on these strategic uh, objectives. Uh, and then the marketplace exercise takes place where people present their proposals. Uh, and this goes in concert with the budgeting exercise. Uh, if these plans are uh, approved, then they go on to further uh, examination by our financing and manpower committees. And then the board of directors of the hospital will also look at these uh, uh, proposals uh, before they get executed, monitored and tracked. Uh, and then you, the whole cycle repeats itself for the next year subsequently. So just a, bit, a few more words about the marketplace exercise. It's part of the corporate planning and budgeting cycle. Uh, it provides an opportunity for departments to share their proposed new projects. And this will include new services and technologies. Uh, senior management will prioritize the projects for further evaluation. Uh, those that cross this first bar after the, 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 the proposal, uh, sorry, after presentation may then be asked to flesh out with more detail. Uh, and at that point also, we might be asked or activated to do a health technology assessment uh, on the certain technologies that are presented in these proposals. Now, a hospital has a medical device oversight committee. Uh, and in fact, in 2014, MOH, the Ministry of Health had actually instructed all public sector hospitals to form these medical device committees. Uh, and these would, were intended to be the equivalent of hospital uh, P&T committees. Uh, and they were to actually, the main purpose was really to implement standard list of medical devices or implants as defined by Ministry of Health. Uh, initially, they came up with uh, a standard list of three implants, total knee replacements, coronary stents, intraocular lenses. And then since then, they've added on one more total hip replacements where they have actually got a standard list of uh, which models of, of these uh, devices are uh, uh, considered as standard and, and will draw subsidy uh, to them. Uh, but having said which, they seem to have uh, kind of like stopped uh, putting up new lists for the moment. And I think they are rethinking the the these particular schemes. Uh, and then just to give an idea of what the uh, MDOC does here in terms of reference, basically it serves in the advisory capacity to our uh, hospital's medical board uh, in all matters pertaining to medical devices and technology-based procedures. Uh, and that will include the use of, the device, of these devices, acquisition and safety. Uh, the next three terms of reference are basically talking about looking at the, the devices at entry and also reviewing current use as well as con considering this continuation or this investment from uh, devices. Uh, and then of course, uh, one of the tools that we have is to be able to make credentialing requirements for certain technologies in case there may be uh, requirements or specifications on the people who can or cannot uh, use a particular technology. Uh, 
uh, we may also advise on and formulate policies and guidelines governing the procurement, evaluation, utilization of the devices. Um, this uh, seventh term is uh, something that the ministry wanted developing that inventory of medical devices. So this relates to the ministry scheme. Uh, and then of course, to be the point of contact with the Ministry of Health for matters regarding medical devices and to provide regular reports as directed by the Ministry of Health. And then just to kind of like summarize all, all the details in, in, the, uh, in the few points, Basically, we oversee the implementation of the ministry's uh, uh, standardized medical device list and monitor utilization of those. Uh, we review evidence and formulate policies for devices and technology-based procedures in general. Uh, and our scope will include not just the introduction of the devices, but also disinvestment, we call, uh, and we will provide recommendations for credentialing where relevant. Uh, the committee is chaired by a senior surgeon. And at the moment, it happens to be a, 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 a ear and throat uh, uh, surgeon uh, and uh, has representatives from clinical departments, uh, the operation theater nursing departments, the supply chain management, quality management, and of course our health services research members also sit on the, the committee. This chart here kind of like uh, summarizes uh, how health technology assessment contributes to decision making around technologies in Changi General Hospital. Uh, if you start at the left side where you know a decision, decision may be needed on health technologies. So this might possibly be at the marketplace exercise or it might be uh, for ad hoc introduction of new technology when it will then be considered by our MDC. Uh, senior management will prioritize which uh, uh, technologies require a health technology assessment and request us to do that assessment. Uh, then there's this process of assessment and appraisal within the, the health technology assessment. Our department uh, will then actually do that, that evidence synthesis where we actually go and look at the evidence from the primary, from the scientific literature. Um, usually this would be a rapid review and then we will look at the things like systematic reviews before uh, rather than uh, the primary research if possible because that, that takes less time to do. Um, and that report then goes up to uh, the MDOC for its uh, further appraisal and uh, further recommendations. So the MDOC plays a part of contextualizing the evidence from the literature. Uh, they consider resource availability, they consider changes to practice and service delivery and other impacts. Uh, and then they make a recommendation uh, to the medical board, uh, for the medical board to make uh, final decisions on. Uh, and at the senior management level, they may bring in other considerations, of course, there may be business considerations, there may, may be issues of staff retention, there may be issues, issues even of prestige taken into account when considering whether to use a new technology or not. Uh, this list of health technology assessment products is probably uh, something familiar to all of you. Uh, I mean, these are the various kinds of ways that you know, the health technology assessment can be reported. Uh, but I just want to highlight that for us, the main work that we do usually is in terms of rapid reviews, uh, mainly because it, it takes much uh, shorter time. We're talking here in terms of weeks to, to a month or so to just to do a, a rapid review, as opposed to a full systematic review or full economic evaluation. Uh, and usually these are enough for the uh, committees or senior management to make a uh, 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 judgment at that point of time. Uh, we do do uh, things like economic evaluations, but not in all cases. And that, that would be a much more specialized kind of request. So just to give you a, a case study of one of these uh, rapid reviews uh, that we've done before, uh, this is a rapid review of uh, uh, cutaneous uh, peritoneal dialysis catheter insertion. And this was a request a few years ago from our uh, renal medicine department. They put up a paper to the medical board proposing a percutaneous uh, peritoneal dialysis catheter insertion service. Uh, there was some concern uh, was expressed over the risk of the procedure. And then I'll say a bit more about this later on. Uh, and the chairman of the medical board then requested the health technology assessment report on the procedure and for the medical device oversight committee to review the service and give their recommendations. Uh, so just a few words about what the technology involves. So we're here, we're talking about, you know, when people, of course, have a kidney failure, chronic renal disease that, that leads to a, a failure of the kidneys. Um, then they usually need to have some sort of dialysis to help replace the kidney functions. Um, most people are familiar with hemodialysis, but there's the option also of doing peritoneal dialysis where, you know, the dialysis is introduced into the peritoneal cavity uh, where the dialysis takes place. Uh, and that introduction requires uh, permanent indwelling uh, uh, peritoneal uh, catheter. Uh, 
and in order to put in the indwelling catheter, then there usually needs to be some sort of surgical procedure. And the techniques commonly used include the uh, open surgical dissection, uh, which would be done in an open uh, operating theater under full general anesthesia, uh, then surgical laparoscopy, uh, and then uh, requiring all, all these uh, are requiring less uh, resources as it were, peritoneoscopic procedure, uh, percutaneous needle guide wire tech, uh, technique. So all these can be done in day surgery or in a, in a thoracoscopy suite, for example. So what were the issues uh, and why did this uh, uh, request come our way? Basically, these uh, indwelling catheters were already currently being uh, done in operating theatres by general surgeons under general anesthesia. But what this means is that then they had to compete with the other uh, surgeries that the general surgeons were doing on a, on a routine basis, right? So you get a long waiting time to surgery for the individual kidney patients and therefore a longer period. And also because it's open surgery, there's a longer period of healing before dialysis can commence. Uh, so it was proposed that nephrologists uh, would do a percutaneous uh, insertion, either in the fluoroscopy room under fluoroscopic guidance and using something called the Seldinger technique, or in a day surgery operating theater using a peritoneal scope. And then in both methods, you don't need a full general anesthesia, but sedation and local anesthesia would, would do. Now there was so there are specific issues also then you have to take into account because this is now we are talking at a very local level right a very operational level uh, and these issues were that for example that the renal consultant that was providing the service or, or was being proposed to, to run the service had actually been trained in the surgical technique in the uk uh, but he was not fully registered to practice in uh, in singapore yet he was conditionally registered to practice only in uh, Changi general hospital right uh, and he needed to be proctored in Singapore before performing it independently. Uh, and then other doctors in Singapore were, that were able to do the Seldinger technique, but also as it happened, conditionally registered at their hospitals. So they couldn't cross hospitals, uh, you know, to uh, teach each other how to do these things. So this is where the, the red tape and the, the bureaucracy comes into it. Uh, one of the, the doctors, uh, nephrologists from the Tan Tok Seng Hospital, that's what TDS shit stands for, uh, could proctor with the peritoneal scope. Uh, and then there was the, our own uh, uh, radiologist within the hospital could proctor the Seldinger technique because that's also used in other procedures, but did not have the specific experience with peritoneal dialysis catheters. And then there were objections raised by some of the surgeons that the Seldinger technique was a blind procedure, right? Uh, there's danger of air embolism with air insufflation in peritoneal scopy. So we did a rapid review on uh, the safety of the various uh, different methods of uh, percutaneous peritoneal dialysis catheter insertion. Uh, these were the elements of our, key two elements of our research question. We're talking about patients requiring peritoneal dialysis. Um, the intervention would be any form of percutaneous catheter insertion with or without image guidance. Uh, the comparator would be what we are doing now, which is open surgical or a laparoscopic insertion. Uh, and then we were interested in the adverse effects, the clinical outcomes. Uh, in this case, the technical success was measured by having a functional catheter after the uh, operation. And here, we had, when we do rapid reviews, we fir in the first instance, we look for uh, systematic reviews or secondary sources first, uh, and then only supplement with primary sources where we don't find uh, 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 a suitable systematic review. So what were the findings from this literature review? Um, there were three randomized controlled trials which showed that percutaneous techniques had either less infections and better capital survival than surgical techniques or were non-inferior to outcomes of surgical techniques. Uh, retrospective and non-randomized studies suggested placement modality did not affect one-year capital survival uh, and they were as safe and effective as the open surgical techniques. Uh, and clinical practice guidelines actually recommended that any of the established techniques could be used and patient characteristics and available operator expertise would determine the choice of insertion techniques uh, offered in other words, the local uh, 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 circumstances would be the uh, biggest determinant. Now, something that, that's uh, slightly different, perhaps from a full uh, uh, rigorous systematic review, is that we supplement our uh, rapid reviews with also uh, speaking to experts. In other words, getting expert opinion from other hospitals uh, in the public sector, as well as sometimes even in the private sector. Uh, and these can sometimes provide uh, valuable insights. True, it is only at the anecdotal level in that sense, but what it is is that they can tell us about the local uh, uh, circumstances, uh, which is not something that you can get from the literature. 
Uh, and we found that locally, uh, the practice varied within the public sector hospitals, ranging from uh, uh, Singapore General Hospital, where the surgeons do the most insertions, uh, to Dundalk Singh Hospital, where the majority are done under a uh, nephrologist-led uh, service. And the practices differed according to what the hospitals were trying to achieve uh, and the local circumstances. Um, so here is where I can I tell you a few uh, pieces of, in a sense, gossip uh, that I don't put into the slides. But uh, so speaking to the experts of other hospitals, we found useful information. For example, although SGH was still doing it with surgeons, like we were doing it at CGH at the time, uh, what happened was that they actually did experiment with a nephrology-led service. But then subsequently, they reverted back to a, a surgical service because the nephrologist told us that they, they found that doing the procedure was taking up too much of their time, clinic time, and they'd much prefer to, to see uh, their patients and do other uh, work uh, rather than the, 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 the processes of doing the uh, insertion themselves. Uh, but Tan Tok Singh had instituted that nephrologist-led service and they were still continuing with doing it. So they still found value in doing it. So I think it's very, this showed that it was very much an issue of what the lo local circumstances were uh, that would help determine which, which uh, way to go. Uh, the other information we got, of course, was that uh, in the past, had actually been a, a case where I think uh, a patient had actually died because of, of uh, em uh, uh, embolism uh, due to the uh, in insufficient uh, embolism due to the, the process of doing the uh, insertion of the catheter before. So that was why I think on the ground, the, the, some of the clinicians were feeling a bit uh, wary about it, right? And they had won against it. So based on that evidence from the literature and also from the local circumstances, we were able to craft various uh, decision, uh, uh, possible decisions that could be made, or options as it were, for the decision maker to take. Uh, one would be retain the current system of catheter insertion by open surgery, but increase the number of operating theater slots for catheter insertion. So you'll see basically, basically this is kind of like uh, remain status quo, but to solve the problem, then insert the, uh, increase the number of OT slots. But of course, where do we get these OT slots from? So in a sense, this was more or less the, the straw man uh, option to put up uh, for, for, for uh, people to uh, choose against rather than, than, than actually selecting. Uh, the other options would be start the percutaneous catheter service run by nephrologists using the peritoneoscopic technique, uh, do it with nephrologists using the Saldinger technique, and with, but with imaging guidance for the safety aspects, right? So there won't be a blind process. Uh, but then that would require the use of the fluoroscopy suite, and then th that would have other implications on the resource use. Uh, or the last option would be let every let a hun hundred flowers bloom, let the, everything could, could be done, uh, and then the, but then again with the consequent uh, uh, use of resources. Uh, so using any technique that, that would be preferred. Uh, in, in addition to these options, we also recommended whichever option that they took that they should have post monitoring of outcomes uh, for the first perhaps either 100 cases or for a period of two years. These were arbitra arbitrary figures uh, depending on the volume of cases. Uh, and then medical board re to review the service quarterly to ensure that patient needs were being met and of course safety standards would be upheld. So again, this would help to reassure the clinicians about the safety of the procedure. Uh, and then do concurrent comparative analysis of the outcomes of all patients undergoing the procedure. Uh, so subsequently, what happened was that after discussion of the report, the Health Technology Assessment Report Medical Board, it was decided to go ahead with the fluoroscopy guided percutaneous uh, uh, insertion, and that would require the use of the angiograph, uh, the fluoroscopic suite. Uh, and after about three years in operation, uh, they've come, the renal department has come back again to us in the health services research. Now to help to do the program evaluation part, the do economic evaluation of the peritoneal dialysis capital insertion services. So I think that that's just a, a very brief kind of like example, uh, I think to illustrate how uh, health technology assessment actually helps uh, at, the, at the local level or the hospital level uh, and you can see that it's not just the, the, the evidence from the scientific literature, uh, but also trying to make it very relevant to the local context and being uh, giving reasonable uh, and uh, uh, contextualized options for the, the decision maker to, to consider taking. Uh, 
yeah, so just to summarize all that, as I said, context determines the kind of health technology assessment that would be useful. Uh, hospital level decision making is specific to the institutional setting. Uh, it does tend to include more operational considerations. Uh, although not directly making coverage decisions, public hospitals still play a role uh, since the entry of new technologies contributes to their becoming mainstream and does still have budget impact. Uh, all right, so I've come to the end of my slides uh, and I'll be very happy to take any sort of any questions that may have come up so far. Okay, I see there are a lot of comments in the chat. I'm just going to uh, quickly scroll through from the top and see what I can answer quickly. Well, if uh, can you, if you can... Uh, well, uh, perhaps if, if Amitra, if you, if you want to moderate. Yeah, yeah. I had already noted the questions uh, you know, to become more efficient uh, for you. Yes. So uh, there are two questions from Sabit. Uh, what is the scope of HTA with regard to the technology type to be assessed? Right, in okay. Part, in particular, drag, medical devices, medical procedures, and so on. Yes. Uh, so um, we, we look mainly at medical devices, uh, but we also would consider uh, procedures. Um, I suppose one way to look at it, it might be to say uh, non-drug uh, non technologies. Because for drug technologies, uh, like all hospitals, I think uh, uh, even in your own countries, you already have uh, pharmaceuticals and therapeutics uh, committees that um, uh, uh, determine what drugs go into your, your hospital's formularies. So similarly in Changi General Hospital, we do have a PNT committee and so any drug issues will go to them uh, for that kind of deliberation. Uh, but for everything else, we have uh, the Medical Device Oversight Committee. Uh, and although it's called Medical Device, but I guess they will absorb uh, the other non-drug non technologies. They may not specifically be Medical Devices. And we found that, you know, then what happens is that some things which we didn't actually realize were medical devices, but are still considered medical devices. For example, uh, viscose supplementation, you know, uh, when uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, inject certain uh, materials into the knee uh, uh, for, for osteoarthritis, uh, because the effect of those, those components are physical rather than, uh, than uh, uh, physiological, right? They are actually considered medical devices and not drugs. <laughs> so we were we were quite interested to to learn that kind of difference, and so we would deal with things like issues like the, uh, that as well. Next is uh, another question: Is there any room to check the quality of the evidence, like the confidence in level on the estimates of the outcome measures? Uh, I'm just going to see whether I can find that um, quality of the evidence. That, oh, confidence level on the estimates. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, we, we basically will look at uh, uh, what the literature just say in the systematic reviews, and we do report on that. Um, the idea here is that we don't do the full systematic review ourselves because that will take a lot more resources and time uh, than we can spend on it. So ideally, we, what we want is that someone else has done th that uh, review already, uh, we take HTA reports from elsewhere as well. We take uh, guidelines from elsewhere. And then we kind of like summarize that in the narrative synthesis uh, at our level. Uh, of course, if we do look at the primary literature, okay, two things. One is, of course, for the systematic reviews, we do also uh, critically appraise them. Generally, we try to use the MSAR 2 instrument to, to appraise the, the systematic reviews. Uh, but sometimes when we supplement with uh, primary studies, because let's say the, the only systematic review that's available is uh, very old or you know, a few years old, we will also then look at the primary literature in the subsequent years as well. And then when we do look at the at primary literature, we do also critically appraise the primary literature that it comes in. Next question Sorry, is, uh, next yes, question yeah. is, uh, is HTA process takes into account cancer drugs uh, how the outcomes are estimated, particularly with regard to quality gained. Okay, right. So as I said, in terms of um, uh, drugs, uh, usually those questions would go to uh, the Pharmaceuticals and Therapeutics Committee. Uh, but if it involves uh, the need for economic evaluation, then they might also approach the, or, or PNT might also then also collaborate with the, uh, our health economists to do that work. Uh, although to my knowledge, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that they've done anything specifically on cancer drugs so far. Okay, 
Okay, so next is uh, next question is how is the prioritization process done? Okay, so at the marketplace level, right? So you've got uh, many uh, uh, proposals that are put up, and the prioritization then would be by senior management. In practice, what happens is that CEO and uh, chairman of medical board, after the presentations, will discuss uh, this within uh, between themselves, and then they will let us know in our department which ones which projects require us to do a further uh, rapid review uh, those topics which uh, go through the medical device committee generally it's the chairman of the committee who will decide if he wants a, a HT report to supplement the, the committee's decision around the technology so that would be the level of prioritization that we're talking about here. Okay, before we take a few more questions uh, there is a hand raised by Alexandra. So uh, I'm requesting uh, Karishma to allow Alexandra to speak. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, hi, Ken Ho. Um, so my question was about the, the evidence base. So most of the uh, clinical and scientific evidence base will be from countries outside Singapore. How, how easy or difficult is it to tell whether that, um, that evidence is uh, relevant to Singapore with your systems, your comparator, comparators, your populations, and so on. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, and that. But I think for most of the technologies that we've looked at so far, that hasn't tended to be uh, that big of an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I mean that would be a limitation that we put in our reports. Uh, if if we if it's very obviously so, uh, when we when we put up the reports to the committee to look at. Uh, but I think generally for a lot of things, for example, like the, the indwelling peritoneal dialysis catheter, I don't think that one we noted uh, mm -hmm. that there were many differences between the different studies and it didn't seem to be uh, a, a big issue. Possibly, I think for medical devices, you get less of this than you might get mm -hmm. in, in right. drug, drug technologies. I think. Yeah. No, thanks. That, that, that's, that's useful to know. Well, the next question is, how is the periodization process done? Well, I, I, if, if you're hoping to see that, you know, there's some sort of scoring system or some very uh, complex uh, system of determining, actually, no, it's not. Uh, it tends to usually be the decision makers uh, uh, who decide and they make the request to us. Uh, so we must remember now we're talking, we're not talking about a national level kind of health technology assessment process. We're really talking about a single hospital, right? You know, we're talking about license for a thousand bits. So that's a big regional hospital uh, size. But in terms of, you know, technologies and all that, you don't get too many coming at the same time that requires that level of prioritization. So mainly it is our, our marketplace exercise. Uh, and, okay, so what happens is then uh, you might get several requests for uh, uh, assessments. So, so more than a, a few technologies. So the, although I'm the only one that does health technology assessment full time, all our analysts, most of our analysts can also do this kind of rapid review work, right? They've been trained to do that. Uh, and so they help out in the marketplace exercise as well. So you can get, you know, uh, uh, us handling more than one uh, review at a time. So, so that in that sense, that helps with the, the handling the, uh, when more than one thing comes in at a time. Well, related to this, uh, you know, when you specified about the national level, there is another question. Could you tell us a bit about how the local HTS interacted with the national HTS body? All right. So generally, we don't interact in the sense that we don't uh, collaborate so much because we are very much serving the needs of the hospital, right? So this would be low level, in that sense, lower level than national level uh, concerns. Uh, and the decisions that are made, are, uh, for example, you know, whether to uh, introduce to the hospital, whether to uh, or rather if introducing under what circumstances to introduce it. And it's much more operational kinds of, of uh, decisions that are being made than at the national level. Uh, certainly if ACE has already uh, made a, a, a ruling or guidance, issued some guidance on a particular uh, technology or, or procedure, uh, then we must take reference on that, obviously. Uh, but at the national level, they don't look at the, the local circumstances. So an issue like, you know, which which indwelling catheter uh, uh, process or, or procedure to use, that would not be something that would concern them. Really. So it's very much uh, doing HTA to serve your decision maker needs. Uh, and ours is really at the local hospital level. 
Well, uh, there are another question, like, do you have any uh, set guidelines for preparing HTA? And, uh, you know, are there any norms for such kind of assessment? Yeah, well, I, I, I guess when you talk about guidelines for HTA, a lot of times you're talking about, uh, especially economic guidelines and how to carry out uh, economic evaluations. So, <laughs> as I said, uh, we are a very small unit. Uh, most of the health technology assessments uh, if they come one at a time, I will end up doing, uh, and it and I've trained the other people in, in the, the department, so we kind of like do the same process for doing a, a rapid review. Uh, if it comes to the economic evaluation, the economic evaluation that would be done by the uh, economic uh, health economists that we have, and not by myself. And I will only give input for the uh, evidence part. Um, so in that sense, that we don't have that kind of. Uh, uh, Guidelines, like a set of economic uh, economic evaluation guidelines that you know a country would use, um, but we, we do do a, a consistent method uh, in the sense that we all more or less have the same structure or format for our reports. And uh, then related to this, is it possible to share you know these guidelines or whatever your you know protocols or norms or HTA products uh, you have uh, you are having to so share? Uh, we don't we don't have as I said guidelines or protocols per se. Uh, if you'd like to look at our reports, I mean, uh, we did put some on, uh, and they may still be online. I think if you do a search from that, but we found that there wasn't that much external interest because it's so localized. Uh, what I would suggest is that if anyone is interested, please email me, and then um, you can you can discuss what you need. Then can you write your email ID uh, to, you know, people... Oh, I'm uh, sorry, did I not? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you write your email yeah, ID so that, fine, you know, there fine. is a communication. Okay, I'm just going to... Uh, you can fine. share the HTA products you have conducted and also the possible guidelines. I'll just and put my email address in the yes. chat. And I've said that. So, by okay. all means, anyone interested, just uh, send me an email and uh, if any although, of your questions. Uh, although we're having time for personal interaction, but here is one more last question, which I have got it from the chat. Uh, this question uh, talks about, does HTA must incorporate the economic evaluation part two, or is it optional? So, so this, this, this really goes to what your philosophy is regarding health technology assessment. I understand that, you know, if you're a health economist, your, your view of HTA is an economic evaluation. But really, health technology assessment exists to support decision making. And it depends what your decision maker needs to make that decision. Uh, yes, in a lot of cases, that final decision really does uh, require a more uh, a close look at the, the budget impact and, and, and the value for money question, certainly. Uh, these actually do take place in our institution, uh, but it tends to be a more downstream kind of thing where after they've crossed that first barrier of uh, is it safe, is it effective, is it something that we think is worthwhile doing and it's cost effective, before they, they look at the budget impact, usually at the finance uh, cycle, uh, finance committee uh, uh, point. Uh, so in that sense, it is a bit downstream from the, the initial part, which is looking at the clinical uh, use of the uh, and clinical approval of the technology well i don't have any more questions over here but we are having some time please feel free to uh, raise your hand so that uh, we can allocate the times uh, uh, which are available uh, maybe about uh, 14 15 minutes to us Looking at the questions, I'm just also wanting to comment on something which I talked about before, which is, again, the relation to the national level. So, for example, I mentioned those standard lists, right? Um, so things like the cardiac stands, the, the cataract lenses, and so on. Uh, so those are the, the area where, you know, if, if ministry has come down with, with those uh, lists already, right, then there's an area that we wouldn't, definitely wouldn't touch, right? We wouldn't want to go and say, you know, use something else if, uh, if ministry has already given that, that ruling on, on the... I think that the thing to, 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 to remember here is that HTA is not a, a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. 
it really depends on what you want, what decision you want to support. And as I said, we are supporting different decisions from what the national agency is supporting. So that's why you will find that you, you know, uh, the kind of work that we do uh, is very different from the kinds of work that will be done at the national level. And I mean, I'm guessing that's also cut, partly why you know, Pavitra might have felt it was of interest to invite someone uh, at my level to actually to talk to your group and uh, let you know that, you know that these kinds of other ways of using health technology assessment uh, work as well. Okay, we are having one more question, but before that, uh, we request uh, Daniela to speak. Uh, she wanted to speak to uh, Ken Ho. Daniela, you're welcome. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Daniela. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, because it was a little bit quiet <laughs> in the room, I was thinking that I might raise, raise a question. Of course, uh, as anyone else, I would like to thank you very much for very interesting and clear presentation. Uh, I would like to know how much in this work to improve and update guidelines, especially due to digitalization, um, it's the work design to calibrate with other uh, health technology assessment uh, organization in Europe, for example. And I'm, I'm mostly interested about these medical devices and uh, special connected to digitalization. Uh, as I said, I have a lot of uh, details what I could raise up, but it was mostly because it was quiet in the room. Thank oh, you. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. You, you know, you're adding vibrancy in our discussion. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for the question, yeah. Nanika. Uh, although I'm, I must try to get some clarification on what you mean when you refer to digitalization. Do you mean information technology or do you mean that the, the HD reports are device? No, I don't. I mean mostly about uh, devices because not only information technology, because we have these mobile apps, for example, what are used very much uh, for both health and social care. And uh, in Europe, uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives to, to, uh, to update the guidelines as uh, soon as possible. And also, uh, perhaps you know that uh, from, 20, uh, from May 2021, we actually in Europe, we have new directives actually uh, about how we should proceed. And uh, these directives try to integrate this part of the digitalization, because like you said, it's very important with information, but it's mostly when people use something for health or social care. Thank you. Both the prevention and the wellness to say so, because it's health. Thank you. So just to clarify again, so what you're saying is uh, using um, uh, digital means to update the doctors and the, the healthcare professionals in terms of what the latest evidence is, is that, is that kind of where you're getting at? And then therefore updating guidelines. Exactly, it is like it is integrated uh, in the care, both yes. healthcare and social care, because these are uh, in yes. health technology assessment, we are we want to have evidence, like you uh, mentioned in some the, uh, of the answer about economic evaluation part of economic and health economic evaluation are part and it is too much too new and so relevant. And into that perspective, I was only curious how you are working with updating guidelines. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for that question. I think I understand you now. Uh, and yes, that, that sort of activity um, does go on. Uh, it's not actually under our health services research department. So that's a slightly different kind of activity that tends to be more uh, within the individual uh, clinical departments. Uh, and that would be, again, also in conjunction with our information uh, and health services, uh, sorry, health information uh, uh, technology services uh, uh, kind of, of uh, departments. Um, and that would also be related to, especially, you know, during COVID, where telemedicine has, has come more into the fore and the use of these kinds of um, medicine at a distance, if, if, if you will. So telemedicine is one aspect of that. Um, guidance, you know, in a, in a form that doctors can easily use, uh, that is another another aspect and I believe that they do uh, try to incorporate it. Uh, so example, in, in the prescribing, for example, there are certain times it, that uh, they build in flags, right? So if you give a particular drug to a patient who happens to have certain comorbidities, I think they have, they have sometimes uh, a program that, so that, that actually puts up an electronic flag to help with uh, uh, prescribing and so on. 
so that sort of activity does go on. Um, we aren't, as the Health Services Research Department, we are very small, as I said, <laughs> uh, basically, there are just 10 staff, uh, and one of which, only one of which does the HTA full time. Uh, so I'm not personally involved in that kind of activity. And I think th um, they generally would not view this in a sense as being an HTA activity per se. Uh, and that's, so that's an interesting thing, you know, the, the, HTA means so many different things to different people around the world. Um, and that sort of activity, I think, would be more uh, what the, depart the clinical uh, uh, departments liaise with the information technology departments uh, to get done, rather than uh, depending on us to, to do that, that sort of work. Well, uh, if, uh, uh, if I can add one more question, uh, uh, there's a question, uh, do you use your HTA work for disinvestment decisions? I could not personally understood uh, uh, this question, but maybe investment or disinvestment decisions, how HTA yes. contributes? Yeah, so here we are referring to, you know, investment is basically when you start using it, right? It's when you introduce, uh, and that's the mo most uh, commonly uh, thought of point when people think of using HTA. Uh, but HTA can also uh, uh, help in uh, reducing the use of uh, disengaging from technology and this, this may not necessarily mean uh, completely stopping to use it but maybe you know uh, making sure that you only use it uh, for where there really is evidence that it still works and that uh, it may not be suitable for everybody and then you reduce the, the scope of usage or really you know if a new technology comes along and then uh, uh, you know in, in the, uh, it supersedes or it's better than the, the older technology said you want to do use less of the older technology. Uh, so yes, we, we do actually also sometimes do that. Um, uh, many times also it's in the, the, the context of when we get a warning from our local, uh, uh, the equivalent of the, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, right? The, we, in Singapore, we have a health sciences authority uh, that deals with licensing of drugs and, and, tech, and medical devices and other technologies. Uh, so sometimes, you know, if there are warnings relating to safety, uh, uh, issues or recalls, then they will also involve uh, a medical device committee as well. Uh, in some, some of those, in most of those cases, right, they don't actually need health technology assessment direct per se because that, that already has been done at the licensing agency level. Uh, but if they want further information, sometimes we can be asked to, to help uh, supplement that information. Uh, how HTA helped the hospital to negotiate prices with the manufacturers? Uh, so the answer to that is no, we don't do that work because that's a national level work. <laughs> so that is specifically uh, uh, one of the things that ACE was set up to do. Uh, they actually uh, work close in hand with, uh, um, so all the, the, the three uh, regional health systems, they actually um, band together because, you know, the, uh, the bigger size of course means bigger negotiating power. Uh, having said which, Singapore is tiny, right, in comparison to, to any one of your, your other larger countries. And we don't have that much negotiating power. So we need to band together. And then at the national level, that kind of negotiation is being done now by uh, the work that the uh, 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 Agency for Care Effectiveness is doing. Uh, and I think they've had some successes in, in helping to, to kind of pull down these prices. But so, no, so, so uh, that doesn't occur at the hospital level per se. Uh, but there is actually uh, a, a, a bodies and committees at the national level uh, to uh, get those kinds of savings and negotiate those prices. So that is done at the national level rather than at the individual hospital level. Yeah, definitely it is doing at the national level, but the contribution is there from the local level. Am I right in my understanding? Uh, maybe in terms of providing information to the, 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 the HTA agency, um, so that's where I suppose the real evidence comes in. If yes. they need info from us, we can provide that information. Yes, basically, although the activity of HTA at the hospital level is to ensure the resource efficiency, but whatever activities are happening at the hospital level, it is having implications at the national level decision making, uh, uh, maybe to the some kind of indirect path. Yeah, but, 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 but this issue, this uh, specific thing that was asked was about the negotiation uh, for drug prices. So as I said, that is done at uh, the national, national level. National level, but definitely the authority or agency takes the input what is happening at the local level, at the hospital level. 
Yeah, so that's where the utilization uh, data comes in and, and provi providing that data. But we don't yes. do the negotiation. Yeah, you may not be doing directly, but you are contributing in a, with your analysis, with your work for the national level yes. decision. If you, like, if you want to look at it that way, yes, you can say that. Yes. Okay, so uh, I think uh, this question has been uh, answered well. So any more co questions you do have or you want to interact with uh, Kenho, you can please raise the hands. We are having maybe three, four minutes time. Uh, and of course, you know, I've provided my email address. So I mean, if you have any questions after as well, just feel free to uh, send yes. me an email. And again, thank you very much for your interactive uh, participation. And uh, anything more, always feel free to write to us. And our next webinar is on 9th of December. And another one is on 16th of December. 9th of December webinar will talk about how the drug procurements in the low and middle income countries contributing to the efficiency of the health systems. And 16th of December, Thursday webinar, we'll talk about how the value is getting added uh, into the uh, US health systems at the state levels through the methodological approach of analyzing health systems efficiency. So I look forward to see you again. And these two webinars, 9th and uh, 16th December, will end our 2021 series. And we'll write to all of you to have your inputs to decide the webinar sessions and the topics uh, sometimes mid of November.